Not every player in Major League Baseball will have a good season in 2024. It may not be fun to watch, but every year, there's always one or two players on every team that don't quite live up to their expectations. They disappoint us. Today, I will be trying to identify those players for the 2024 season, one from each team. It's not just going to be my opinion on the player, it's going to be through using stats. These players have some numbers that suggest that they won't live up to their expectations. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel. If you're a baseball fan, this is the place you want to be for the 2024 season. With that being said, let's get into the players. First off with the Arizona Diamondbacks, I have Geraldo Perdomo. He was an all-star last season. He makes a lot of contact and doesn't chase, but the quality of contact is just not there. He was in the third percentile on exit velocity and first percentile in both barrel rate and hard hit rate. If you want to have a good offensive season with those kinds of numbers, you're going to have to get lucky, and he did. His WOBA was 44 points higher than his expected WOBA. The second half of the season, his WRC Plus was just 75 compared to the 118 from the first half. Most likely, he's not going to repeat this type of production in 2020. 24. I don't think he'll be awful because he's still going to walk a good amount, but chances are his numbers are going to take a step back in 2024. Now for the Los Angeles Dodgers, I have Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Obviously, the expectations are pretty high with him after signing the biggest starting pitcher contract in the history of Major League Baseball. I don't think he's going to be bad, but in year one, I don't think he's going to live up to those contract numbers. Just take a look at Kodai Senga last year. His first half of the season was not good, but in the second half, he was arguably the best pitcher in the league, and overall his stats weren't that of an elite pitcher. Major League Baseball is a lot different than the NPB. The ball is different, the environment is different. In spring training, Yamamoto has been struggling a bit. I'm not saying we need to sound the alarms, but we need to temper the expectations a bit. For the San Francisco Giants, I have starting pitcher Jordan Hicks. I'm not sure what the Giants are doing with this move, to be honest with you. They signed Hicks to a four-year, $44 million deal this offseason to be a starting pitcher. Let me remind you that he's pitched five seasons in Major League Baseball and has started in just eight games. The most innings he's ever pitched in a single season has been 77.2, and that was in 2018. His arsenal is not built for a starter. He's really just a three-pitch guy, sinker, sweeper, four-seamer. He does rarely throw a slider and splitter, but that's less than 5% combined. He walks a lot of guys. The pitch count's going to be hard to keep down. He has good stuff. Probably plays better in the bullpen. He's a great reliever. I just don't know what the Giants are doing putting him in the starting rotation. For the Colorado Rockies, it's hard, but I decided to just go with the entire rotation. Just take a look at the names in this rotation and tell me how they're going to fare in Coors Field. They are going to get bullied. Whatever expectations you have for them already, lower them. They need to be lowered. Just take a look at the fangrass projections for these guys. It's not pretty. I'm sorry, Colorado. It's a tough time, but it is the truth. For the San Diego Padres, I have first baseman Jake Cronenworth. Now, it's not really Cronenworth's fault, but first base just isn't his position. He was a solid defensive second baseman. That's where he got a lot of his value from and how he was able to put up back-to-back four-plus war seasons in 2021 and 2022. At first base, though, it's all about hitting. And it doesn't help when he moved to first base last year. He also had the worst offensive season of his career. I think those numbers could bounce back, but the chase rate was at an all-time high. The walk rate was at an all-time low. His exit velocities were the lowest since he's entered the league. He is 30 years old after all, so he's not exactly the youngest player in the league anymore, but the main thing is the positional value that tanks him and why he's my pick for the Padres. For the Pittsburgh Pirates, I have Martin Perez. It was kind of hard to pick someone from this team. They have a lot of young guys, not too many players with high expectations, and the ones that do have high expectations, I also have high expectations for. So they signed Perez for $8 million this offseason, and he's going to be their number two starter at the start of the season, which is not a good thing. He had a fifth percentile strikeout rate last year and a FIP near five in 142 innings. In 2022, he did record an ERA of 2.89 in 196 innings, but that was just his second season posting an ERA under four, and he's been pitching since 2012. His underlying numbers in that 2022 season weren't even that good, so that suggests that was kind of just a one-year outlier. He's going to be 33 years old. I don't think he's going to be a number two starter at all in 2024. And Pirates fans are probably going to be disappointed in his performance. For the Chicago Cubs, I have Cody Bellinger. The Cubs signed him to an $80 million contract about a month ago after his bounce back season. For me, though, I'm not really buying into this bounce back season. 
When you think back to Cody Bellinger's prime, he was a power hitter, always hitting the ball hard. In 2023, though, his exit velocity was in the 22nd percentile, so he really didn't even get close to who he was in 2019. The one thing he did improve on was striking out less, as he lowered his strikeout rate to 15.6%, which is in the 87th percentile. The problem is, his WOBA was 43 points higher than his expected WOBA, meaning he wasn't making quality contact, but was still getting good results. This means there's probably some luck involved. Does this mean that he's automatically going to be bad in 2024? No. To me, it just seems like a repeat year is not going to happen unless he starts hitting the ball hard again. For the Cincinnati Reds, I have Jamer Candelario. The Reds signed him to a three-year, $45 million deal, which is a lot of money considering Matt Chapman only got $54 million when he has a much better track record. Just two years ago in 2022, this guy put up negative .1 war. In 2023, though, he was much better, posting a 3.3 war and a 117 WRC+. The problem is, he overperformed his expected WOBA, similar to Bellinger. His difference wasn't as bad as it was only 28 points. I think the expectation should be turned down a little. I don't think he's going to be a three-war player, and I don't think that he's going to be worth the contract that the Reds gave him, but only time will tell. I could be wrong. The numbers just don't really support it. For the St. Louis Cardinals, I have Nolan Arenado. Arenado has always been a weird player when it comes to the underlying numbers. He always has been a great power hitter in terms of production, always hitting a lot of home runs and extra base hits, but the exit velocities have never really been there. He likes pulling the ball down the line, and you don't have to hit the ball hard to hit home runs down the line. But I'm not talking about his offense, I'm talking about his defense. Last year was the first year he didn't win the gold glove in 10 years. Key Brian Hayes took that title in 2023, and that was for good reason. Arenado only put up 5 outs above average, which is still good, but not Nolan Arenado level. Just for reference, the lowest outs above average for Arenado before was 10, and with his highest being 22. 5 is very low for him. It looks like the defense is slipping, and that's where a lot of his value comes from. Last year, he put up just 2.6 war, which is the lowest he's ever put up in a full season, and I expect similar numbers in 2024 if the defense doesn't come back. For the Milwaukee Brewers, I have a weird one to be honest, and it's Jackson Chorio. Don't get me wrong, great prospect, I just don't know if he's ready to be an everyday Major League player. He has yet to play a game in the majors, he's only played 6 games in AAA, the stats in the minor leagues weren't really that good. Last year in 122 games in AA, he put up a 112 WRC+, which is good, but not like crazy top prospect good. He's ranked so highly of a prospect because of his tools and his ceiling, I don't think he's going to come anywhere closer to that ceiling in 2024. He'll probably be a little bit disappointing for Brewers fans similar to Jordan Walker on the Cardinals last year. For the New York Mets, I have Jeff McNeil. He's had two good seasons in his career, 2019 and 2022. Both of those years, his WOBA greatly exceeded his expected WOBA, 34 points in 2019 and 42 points in 2022. In his down years, the gap is a lot smaller. He's a contact-oriented hitter, so he really relies on his hits getting down. In 2023, that was a problem because he wasn't hitting as many line drives. In 2022, his sweet spot percentage was in the 94th percentile, which means he was hitting a lot of balls with a launch angle between 8 and 32 degrees. In 2023, though, that number went down to the 25th percentile. As a contact-oriented hitter, line drives are very important, and McNeil wasn't able to do that in 2023, which is what caused him to have a down year. In 2024, there's a very good chance that that will happen again. For the Philadelphia Phillies, I have JT Real Muto. He's had his worst season of his career last year, and I don't think he's going to bounce back from it. Real Muto was often regarded as the best catcher in the league because of his ability to do everything, play elite defense, run the bases well, and hit at an above average level. In 2022, he had a 97th percentile fielding run value, meaning he was one of the best defenders in the game regardless of position. Defense at catcher is obviously very important, so this made Real Muto automatically one of the best catchers in the game. In 2023, however, he had a 5th percentile fielding run value, and it's very scary to see a drop like that. He's going to be 33 years old, and we don't really see down defensive seasons often, so a bounce back in that department is not likely. He's also a lot worse on the bases. At the plate, he was still okay, but he lost his two biggest things that separated him from the other catchers in the league. It would be different if he had a down year offensively, but I don't like to see the sharp decline in defense and base running from a guy who was known for that. For the Miami Marlins, I have a Visael Garcia. 
Now, I don't think he's going into the year with high expectations or anything, but he's currently projected to be the starting designated hitter for the Marlins after posting a 46 WRC plus in 2023 and 63 WRC plus in 2022. This guy is your designated hitter and putting up these offensive numbers. You're going to be disappointed no matter what. For the Washington Nationals, I have K-Bear Ruiz. He was the worst defender in all of baseball last year, and he plays the most important defensive position on the field. This is not a good combination. To go along with that, he made a lot of weak contact, 16th percentile average exit velocity. He does make a lot of contact though with a 97th percentile whiff rate and a 99th percentile strikeout rate. He makes a lot of contact, just not a lot of loud contact. Combine that with his bad defense, I don't like him too much going into 2024. For the Atlanta Braves, I chose Jared Kelnick. This is another team that's hard to pick from. Their roster, pretty good everywhere you look, but people might get a little bit too excited about Kelnick. Obviously, he had the prospect hype, then struggled a lot. Last year, he put together some decent numbers for the first time in his career, but I think those are a little misleading. All I really want to point out with him is that he was an above average hitter last year for just one month. In April, he posted a 169 WRC+, plus, but in the months following, the highest WRC+, plus he put up was in May with 98. It kind of just seems like he got a lot of things to go his way in April, then went back to his old ways. I'd rather see a full year of consistent production, obviously. Maybe surrounded by all this talent in Atlanta can help unlock his potential, but I just don't see it happening with Kelnick. Now moving to the American League, starting off with the Los Angeles Angels, I have Mickey Moniak. Moniak put up a decent half a season last year in 85 games. He posted a 114 WRC plus and 1.5 F4 in that time span, but I don't think he'll come close to matching that in 2024. The biggest red flag from Moniak's game is his discipline. He walked a minuscule 2.8% of the time last year, and that was a product of his 47% chase rate, which would have been the worst in the league had he gotten enough plate appearances to qualify. This also caused his strikeout percentage to be at 35%, which is not ideal when you combine that with his low walk rate. If you're hitting like this, it's going to be very hard to be a consistent hitter and very hard to put up any good results in the future. For the Oakland A's, it's Estaori Ruiz. A lot of people point to the stolen base numbers last year. He put up 67. He has a 97th percentile sprint speed, but it doesn't really translate to the outfield and defense. As far as the base running goes, he's definitely good, but the problem is he doesn't get on base enough to take advantage of it. He had a second percentile walk rate in 2023 that led to an on-base percentage of just 309. He needs to develop some other tool other than his speed because right now, that's all he really has in my eyes. If he's able to work up some discipline though, he could be a valuable offensive player, but for now, I think he's going to be pretty disappointing. For the Texas Rangers, I have Nathan Avaldi. This is another team hard to pick from. They won the World Series last year, obviously. They got a lot of good players. He's getting up there in age. He's going to be 34 years old. His numbers fell off in the second half of the year last year. He got injured. Right now, he is the Rangers' number one guy. If you're expecting him to be that number one guy, he's going to disappoint you. The velo was down last year. The walk rate went up. These are pretty big signs of a regressing starting pitcher. For the Seattle Mariners, I have Logan Gilbert. Now, don't get me wrong. I think Gilbert is great. He's put up great numbers in the past. I just don't think he's going to take that next step this year. Something that concerns me when I look at Gilbert's arsenal is the lack of a good fastball. He throws a four-seamer, slider, splitter, and curve. He throws the four-seamer the most, but it's also his worst pitch. Batters hit it at a 280 average and a 491 slugging with a 505 expected slugging. Those are pretty high numbers for his most used pitch. It had a whiff rate of just 17%, which is pretty low. These days, there's always a lot of talk on the spin rate on the fastball, but Gilbert throws his at just 2,000 RPMs, which is a lot lower than the average, and it's the fourth worst among starting pitchers. I think he's a good pitcher now, but I question his ceiling and if he can actually turn into a great pitcher. Finishing up the AL West for the Houston Astros, I have Framber Valdez. Ever since Fromber has come into the league, he always has given up a lot of hard contact, but he uses his sinker to induce a lot of ground balls, so that doesn't really matter. The hitters would hit the ball hard, but they would go right into the ground, so it wouldn't do much damage. The problem is, though, his ground ball rate has gone from 70.4% in 2021 to 67.4% in 2022 to 55.2% in 2023. 
this is not a trend you want to be seeing because hitters are still hitting him hard as he had a 6th percentile hard hit rate in 2023. Now though, more of those hard hits are line drives and fly balls, so they are starting to do more damage. As you can see in his numbers, 2023 was not his best season for this very reason. If this trend continues, the numbers are only going to get worse for Fromber. For the Minnesota Twins, I have Royce Lewis. This pick is similar to the Logan Gilbert pick. Royce Lewis I think is good, but I think people are getting a little bit carried away. I've seen some people say he's an MVP candidate, and we are really falling victim to a small sample size here. It was 58 games last year, and his WOBA was 42 points higher than his expected WOBA. It was a small sample size, and things were going his way. I think he's good. I think he makes good contact. I think he's above average, but the numbers don't really support him being anything more than an above average player going into 2024. For the Detroit Tigers, I have Jack Flaherty. This team has a lot of young talent, and there's a lot of young talent that I like, so I had to do kind of a bailout pick with Jack Flaherty. Some people think he could bounce back in 2024, but the numbers really don't support that. Every metric has gotten worse since 2019. The strikeouts aren't there. He's walking more people. The Tigers signed him to a one-year $14 million contract, which it's one year, so it's not that big of a deal, but I don't think he's going to be too reliable for them in 2024. For the Kansas City Royals, I have the entire bullpen. James McArthur is the only guy I can somewhat get behind, and even then it's still a little questionable. Will Smith, he's older. Nick Anderson, he's older. Chris Stratton, these guys are going to be getting a lot of meaningful innings for this team. That AL Central is going to be up for grabs. Some say the Royals could make a run, but I don't think they even stand a chance with this bullpen. Ten years ago, this team had one of the best bullpens ever assembled, and now it's one of the worst. For the Cleveland Guardians, it's Emmanuel Classe. It was a very weird season for Mr. Colossae last year. The arsenal didn't change. He was still throwing that nasty 100 mile per hour cutter, but the strikeout rate went down 7%, which is a lot. It went from the 83rd percentile to the 33rd percentile. When we're talking about elite relievers, we need those strikeouts. The pitches didn't change, same velocity, same spin rate. I guess my best explanation is that the hitters just figured him out. Feels like he should still be racking up the strikeouts, still throwing his 92 mile per hour slider, 100 mile an hour cutter. It's just worrisome to me and I, I would not invest much into Class A stock for 2024. For the Chicago White Sox, I have the whole team not named Luis Robert. Just kidding. I have Andrew Vaughn. 2023 was supposed to be the year for Andrew Vaughn. He was finally going to get that everyday job at first base. Didn't have to worry about bouncing around from left field, right field anymore. Former top prospect can settle in and start tapping into that potential finally. Yeah, that didn't happen. And it's time to jump off the Andrew Vaughn train if you're still on it. He hits the ball somewhat hard with a 73rd percentile exit velocity, but he doesn't walk. Doesn't get a good launch angle consistently with a 12th percentile sweet spot percentage. He chases too much with a 29th percentile chase rate. And this is supposed to be his thing. He's supposed to be a hitter. And in year three, we haven't seen much improvement. Theoretically, a breakout year is still possible, but the numbers just don't suggest that's going to happen. For the Toronto Blue Jays, I have George Springer. I think it's kind of old news now that George Springer's past his prime. He's not hitting the ball hard anymore. In 2023, he had an average exit velocity in the 29th percentile. The production wasn't there. The defense has gone downhill. He's 34 years old, and I think we're really going to see that decline in 2024. For the New York Yankees, I have Anthony Volpe. I don't know if it's just because he's the shortstop for the Yankees or because he was a first round pick, but I don't really get the hype for Anthony Volpe. Defensively, he put up one out above average last year, so pretty close to average defensively. The offensive production wasn't there, and the underlying numbers don't really add too much promise. Obviously, he's still very young, and there's no reason to give up on him, but the expectations need to be a little bit lower. For the Tampa Bay Rays, I have Isaac Paredes. This is like the 90th time I've talked about Isaac Paredes on this channel. I don't know how he keeps coming up, but he does. You probably already know the spiel, but I'll give it to you anyway. Most people would think a guy who hits 30 plus home runs is a pretty good power hitter, right? High exit velo, high barrel rate, well, not exactly. Paredes had an exit velocity in the 13th percentile last year and somehow still hit 31 homers. It's because he pulls the ball down the line a lot to the shortest part of the field, similar to Arenado who we talked about before. The question is, can he repeat this? If this was a stock on the stock market, it's going to be very volatile. Could go up a lot, but it also could take a nosedive. I would just avoid it. For the Baltimore Orioles, I have Yanir Cano. He had a breakout season last year, but I think he's far from that elite reliever conversation. 
This is mainly because of his strikeout rate. It's in the 57th percentile. He often relies on the ground ball to get his outs, which when you think of elite relievers, you think of the elite strikeout numbers. Now, don't get me wrong. I still think he's going to be a great reliever. Just some people are jumping the gun a bit on him too much. He's going to be 30 years old, so it's not likely that there'll be any major improvements for him into 2024, and I would just hold off on the expectations. Lastly, for the Boston Red Sox, I have Kenley Jansen. I don't know, it was hard for me to pick someone on the Red Sox, but I ended up settling on Jansen. I think his name carries most of his value at this point. We saw a 5% drop in the strikeout percentage last season, which makes sense. He's 36 years old. He's had a great career, but I think the downfall of Kenley Jansen is going to start to take place here in 2024. Sadly, but it's true. It all has to end at some point. Just like this video, it's over. You've now seen my disappointing picks. This video wasn't that too fun to make. I didn't really enjoy making this video having to be disappointed the whole time, but it's just as important to pick the regressions as the breakouts, so you gotta do it. Let me know what you think. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.